particular one that turned down a seven hundred thousand dollar offer, there was going to be eighteen houses on that land. So we preserved that open space, but it cost us five hundred thousand dollars. But if you look at the value of that twenty six acres today, I assure you it would have to be eight hundred or a million. So you know, a big scheme. You, you have to make decisions. If you're really committed to open space, you got to be really willing to write a check for it sometimes. But if you add the purchase price but plus how much we spent on it, that was over a million bucks for 15 acres. So No, we, we haven't spent anywhere near that. I um, didn't follow that order. No. Well, it was just in the paper that the loss on the Gordon Harbor build, building, oh, I thought that was a... I thought that was a five, it's a dollar sign. Fifty-two thirty-seven. So you're right, more like a hundred thousand. So half a month, five hundred thousand for the fifteen acres, which is still a why, great deal. Why is that a loss? Because the, the cost was one hundred thirty-seven thousand four hundred thirty-eight dollars, and it sold for eighty-four six eighty. So it showed as a loss. Well, but that's what we spent on it to consider making it a town. But so we're talking about a portion of, of what now is was at the time thirteen point point three acres that we paid three hundred ninety nine thousand for. So we we've still come out way ahead on that from a, a just the standpoint of adding to our assets. So. Let's look at number 12, the last one, and it's, it's a big one. We talk about this a lot depending on uh, when, when we open our mouths what we're trying to justify, right? Uh, Summerfield is a limited services local government. jurisdictions across 12 counties, right? 75. What, what does limited services, when you think of Summerfield in comparison uh, to a full service town, what what do you think of when you think of us? Or what do you think of limited services government in general <coughs> to know are we hitting that? Okay, these are terms that you have to put in context. So when we you, Greensboro, or Winston-Salem, and those cities of, completely different picture mm -hmm. in pretty much every way, financially, and from resources available, taxes, tax revenue, on and on. So I think what I would encourage is thinking of the number of residents that are in Summerfield compared to other municipalities. Um, I would think of what it is, what services you're counting in limited services. Because you're not without options or choices. Um, these are all kind of managed over time by previous councils and previous leadership. Uh, I would just think carefully how you define what you want to limit, what you do not, uh, what you have control to do. Because you're just a different jurisdiction than the Greensboro or Winston or large metropolitan areas. Uh, I know I'm not being very specific, but that's intentional because you're, as a present council and as a present staff, you know, we weren't all here forever. Um, I forget when the town was incorporated. I should 96. Say. 96, okay. Some of us conceivably could be that. But a lot of us have predecessors and decisions have been made. You're coming to it at the point you're at now. So, Determining, I think you went through this process with a code enforcement officer. That seemed to be a new, was that in the last year? Well, we used to contract that out and we brought it in-house. Okay. That's a really great example as to how Summerfield defines limited services and rationalizing or even a reason to invest in that in a different way for previously you contracted. And I kind of apply that to a lot of things. I think about the town and what services you want to offer in house or offer at all. So, is it the title code enforcement officer? It's, it's planning planning technician slash, slash enforcement officer. I'm sorry, I didn't know the technical yeah. term, but just... and, and so think about think about why this was important to the town 
at the time the comp plan was adopted. We, we formed as a town largely, largely as a paper town to avoid being gobbled up by Greensboro. It was a defensive mechanism. And that's why we're here. And, you know, so that started out uh, mayor council form of government, uh, very few employees. We were still pretty much the same place that employee wise as we were when I came 11 and a half years ago. But what as towns will do is they grow and evolve. Um, they, they realize being, there's more to being a town. There are things that people want. There the citizens say, gosh, we want a park. We just moved here. We want a park. We want a trail. We want, we want amenities. We want some things. And so, you know, it's a really challenging balance to, you know, to grow with a community at a slow enough pace where, you know, we still define ourselves as that. And, and I think we very much are because our core services were really administration, uh, parks and rec, and planning. Uh, we don't have public works at all. We don't have. We don't maintain any roads. We don't have uh, Powell Bill streets uh, that we maintain. Uh, the sheriff's department is doing our law enforcement. Uh, we have a separate fire district. Uh, we contract for. Uh, we contract for uh, trash and recycling. I mean, there's so many services that that we're not providing, and that's why we have a 2.75 tax rate. So, does everybody agree that we're, even amid a lot of uh, growth pressures, we're, we're doing pretty good at that, or do you think otherwise? I wonder if the people would rather us have more amenities if that means we have to raise taxes, or would they rather keep the amenities as they are and keep the taxes where they are? So someday after this meeting, go to our website and look at our parks, trails, and open space master plan uh, done by Withers and Ravenel. Uh, that's a more recent plan that said what they wanted in relation to uh, parks and those related amenities. So take a look at that. Right, but I wonder would they still want it if they knew that meant their taxes were going to go up. That might tell us what they want, but that doesn't yeah. tell us anything about their feelings about taxes. And those are really good questions to, to process in any kind of update. I think their priority company. is taxes. They rather yes. keep their taxes low. So I think that's something to keep in mind as we add things, buy more properties, add more parks. If that means we're going to have to raise taxes, I don't know that the people would want us to keep adding more parks. Maybe they'd feel like, we have enough parks now. And to Scott's point, again, I keep saying planning because that's kind of what I live in every day, but it's both a document and a process. So some of those, the question you asked very plainly there about that trade-off of taxes or services, whether it be parks or another kind of service, exactly what you kind of can get through the process of a comprehensive plan or really any planning process. But, um, that open space, that. do they want us to keep buying more open space so that it will forever be open space? But that means we need more people in the to, to mow grass. And that means maybe more taxes. So I just wonder what, how, where, where's that balance? Would people rather us keep buying stuff if it means more taxes or are we do they want us to hold steady? I just So we're doing pretty good? Is that what we're hearing? I think we're growing slowly. I don't know if they want us to. So I don't know. So define what you mean by that. Adding because employees. staff staff yeah. is really like I'll give you an example when when I came there was a there was time before I came that the planning department, there were three three dedicated employees. Is that when we've we got two employees. When we did and, contract and most it out? of the time I've been here, we've had one. Is that when we did not contract it out? Uh, that was in addition to contracting out. We had three people in planning, plus we, we contracted out the code enforcement? I believe so, Tom. Yeah, and we, we still, Parks and Rec, we still have a Parks and Rec director, full-time employee, 
and one part-time parks attendant and two seasonal workers. Mm -hmm. We still have a clerk. We still have a part-time finance officer. Okay. When I came, we had a part-time events coordinator. That's still the same. Mm -hmm. So but we have an open. We have. Do we have one more open position? Uh, we we were advertising for project manager, and we kind of pulled that back, trying to manage that with the planning staff that we have now. Is that a, a right now? Is it's that a not position a, that was once filled? It wasn't. No, so that's, that's a new position. That's never been filled. right, but not been filled. Are you saying we're net neutral since roughly about the time that you came on? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah th I have a. We really had three people in the planning department, plus we contracted out stuff. I believe we contracted out the code enforcement at that time. That's the only unknown, but I remember, yeah, we did. And so think of that. That was kind of the height of development, too, back the mid-2000s there. We had a lot of communities being built, a lot of rezonings going on. So, Adam, so you think we're doing overall pretty good on that, but is that what I'm hearing? I think there's some external factors that's perhaps pushing us to have less of a limited service government. I agree. Yeah, that's a good point. And and we, like what you would see if you if we dug down, if you pick this one to dig down into, uh, to look at the policies that underpin it, one of the things it's going to say is that um, that we will, as far as staff. It will grow as as the need grows. And in essence, it says as as that comes to fruition, we will add staff. But we're still pretty neutral on that for the time that I've been here. So, Adam, why don't you see what uh, their preferences are? Something, the topic they want to dig down into a little bit more. So I started starring things that I felt like you talked a lot about, but it is up to y'all as far as which. Priority area 1 of the 12 we would like to look at all the policies that underpin it. Like Scott said, kind of use the comprehensive plan the way it was meant to. Uh, but again, I, I confess before my government life, I didn't make a habit of looking at comprehensive plans and referencing these things. So it can uh, kind of be hiding in plain sight for a lot of citizens and folks. But I think it's good just to, again, I want y'all to guide this. Um, we have some that have more discussion than others, but which one would the group like to dig into further and look at the policies? <coughs> I think it was mentioned in a couple of them about interconnectivity. Uh, I think we had spoken some about that. Mr. Sesson, Mayor Sesson said uh, you know, things have changed over the last 10, 15 years since we're who are kids uh, riding their bikes to school. Yeah. And so I think any of those that have the interconnectivity in them probably would be a bad idea to evaluate. Okay, we have that in the first two for sure. We have that in our section about schools, since that's the way the conversation went. I'm talking about connecting an athletic facility with a school. Uh, Y'all have a preference between maybe one of those first two or the sidewalk, the blackway and trail system, that, that might be a good one. All right. Unless anyone's opposed. Yeah. General question. Adam, I, I thought you said that, you know, I guess a, a rough estimate for a land use plan or a comp is to update that every five, ten years. And this was, I guess, started in 08, adopted in, in 10, is 14 years old. Not that we're not up for the challenge, but why is this town council now talking about uh, amending and updating? Good question. So if you, you go back to, um, take it back a little bit to when we really got most serious about the, uh, updating the, uh, the development ordinance. We had a UDO review committee that worked about 18 months with recommendations, and one of the things they said was a land use plan. So we jumped on that We uh, not too long ago, a couple years ago, got serious about it, and we were having a conversation at the same time about 
but we really need to update the comp plan too. And so council's position has been for the last couple of years, as soon as we get that land use plan adopted, we're going to, and we've already budgeted at this past year, we're going to, we're going to update the comp plan. And then fast forward, the annexation threat got us off track with the land use plan uh, and the, the timing of that. And here we are um, with a, a reconstituted council who's considering uh, the, the need of both the land use plan and the comp plan. So it was supposed to come after that. The land use plan hasn't happened, but, but wow, it's old at 14 years. So we don't have to address it, right? I well, mean, we well, well so... Put on us, do we have to? We're just discussing it. Yeah. But we, Mayor says he should be, I think he was right earlier too, you know, with everything going on, living over top of us, we shouldn't do anything at this time. I think he was exactly right about that. I think we're just discussing it. So apart from the practical reasons why uh, a community would want to update their comp plan, um, we had some feedback. I'm trying to remember from a, a, a respected person. I'm trying to remember if it was the School of Government, I think, instead of the League of Municipalities within the last year. I think that was a conversation held at PTRC. The question was asked uh, by town staff, what, what do you think about our comp plan being 13 years old at the time? And, and that legal guidance and, and response back was, you're, you're probably pretty far out of bounds. Back to what Adam said before, there's not good case law yet that, uh, that establishes what reasonable, uh, reasonably maintained means. But I think most people in, in the planning world would would say that 14 years is long in the tooth, as they say. And the perceived renewed attention statewide, again, tied to that July 2021 start of 160B being implemented, which spelled that out in the statute. So Scott's right, it says reasonably maintain, and then give you a year threshold to do that. But it put a Put an emphasis on the fact one legally you have to have one which that wasn't the case before then um, and two again while it doesn't define a year it defines reasonably maintain or tells you that so case law like we said will decide if there's a, any further clarification of that and would you want would any town want to be part of the case law that decides that or not i think just reviewing it probably would help satisfy the reason to maintain like that we review it every what? year. What's that? Sorry, and um, that we review it. Every the definitions there too, being review and update. I, mean, I think we're discussing like with a land use plan or a comprehensive plan that full uh, recommendation from the planning board and adoption. It also says somewhere in there, and I don't, know, I don't remember the actual verbiage or verbiage um, that. You have to have one or the other. You don't necessarily, you have to have the comp plan, but not necessarily the land use plan. So my question is, does the comp plan drive the land use plan? Like, is it better to have a comp plan? And should, I'm not saying today or tomorrow, but should this be put as a priority to revamp this, make sure this is what the community wants, these are still our goals? Um, and then once we get that laid out, then work on the land use plan. Does that make sense? Are you, are you asking if there's just one better to do than the other? Should we not update the comp plan and make sure that it continues to drive what the community and the citizens want? Update that and then have the land use plan come in and because I see it, it as being a more detailed oriented. It's more specific. Well, given that the land use plan was a year ago, I forget the It was staff. tabled. It was what? It was tabled. Right. So I think it was, like it. Okay. So uh, I, what I was saying there is remembering back to where these planning processes take the time and resources. That would be a council decision. It would be up to you all to kind of decide if that whole process would need to start again 
after it was done. Okay, does it just, yes or no, does a client plan drive a land, a land use plan? Or vice versa? Uh, they are or does a land use plan complement? The um, maybe is, I think it's smart to view them as interlocking. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not really, uh, I see what you're saying. It, it's more of a, all, because you could have as many as 10 or 11, you can have all the plans you want on specific different areas, uh, whatever is important to a town. Uh, these interlock, it's not sequential all the time. Uh, it really is for, a lot of times, having an old timeline. If okay. one's been updated more recently, that's just how it, that's just how it works out. Okay. We largely interlock to form your kind of body of policies with development regulations, planning process, uh, important areas of emphasis. So they, they really do kind of form your universe of regulations and guidance and policies. And, and is it fair to say that citizens don't like a land use plan that never got to the public hearing stage? The recommendation came from the committee. The de-annexation happened. Council decided this could change maps. It could change the plan in a great way. So let's get through this de-annexation threat first. And so it has not gone to the planning board for their hearing and recommendation. And we, we really don't know how that's perceived other than what citizens have said leading up to that. But there was a, a presentation for the public, and the public came yeah, and gave feedback meeting. on it. Right, but we school. went back, and, and there was quite a bit revised after that, that ended up in the recommendation that's going to the planning board. No. There was not a lot revised. No, there were parts that were supposed to be taken out and redone, and that wasn't... It's the part that they were up in arms about did not get changed. And the maps didn't change. Okay. It changed well, the coloring of the map, so that was... Marketed better. Well, as, as the manager, my the directive that I heard during that time was, we're we're pushing pause on the land use plan moving forward to the planning board for consideration because of the de annexation. It wasn't because people didn't like it. So so that's a it whole a different. Commit, it went to a committee, a citizen committee, because the citizens didn't like it. And they finished with a recommendation. They never came to an agreement. They didn't. And so they said, that's just not true. It's not true? OK, not I believe true. you. I, that, <laughs> but there was much, a lot of disagreement. Scott, would you tell me that one more time? Yeah. yeah. Would yes. you discuss it? So the committee that was, was recommending, making a recommendation to the planning board for the land use plan. And when was this? Eventually came last spring, I think it was. I'd have to look back. Came to terms on a, a, a recommendation to forward to council. And maybe it was right before that March rollout of the de-annexation threat and emergency meeting. And somewhere into that battling with the de-annexation, we talked about, council talked about, there is, uh, you know, this could really change. If we adopt this during this, while we're, we have lobbyists and we're trying to negotiate on this de-annexation matter. It doesn't make sense to go through with this involved formal public process until we know how that's going to shake out. And so... I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I don't think the de-annexation had anything to do with the status of the land use plan. The problem is that the 